it's not the same thing, these Zoom rooms, but I'm really glad we have them. Yeah, it's a lot better than not having, for sure. Yeah. All right, so everyone that's listening, we'll get started here in about a minute or two. If you're trying to get your notes ready, we're on lesson 13 today. How to pray the right way. Boy, do we need to pray the right way nowadays. It's a good thing we have a good model from Jesus. This is lesson 13. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to mute everybody and then have everybody discuss later on. But if you're joining and you want to turn a camera on so others can see you, that's nice. If you don't, that's fine also. But I, I tell you, when we had the men's breakfast yesterday, it was a real delight when the guys turned the cameras on. You could actually see each other, so no pressure, particularly if you're not feeling up to it. Um, you don't want a camera in your face. We got that, but um, it's really nice seeing some folks after not being able to see them for so long. And I'm going to do what I've done before, read a little, talk a little, teach a little, then pause and see if we have hands. You can either raise the hand from the picture or you could push the raise hand spot and be patient with me because my skills are not that great at this stuff, as you already know. So I've muted everybody. That's good when you, you come in. That way we don't hear all the noise in the background. Looks like we've got 33 in the class or so already, according to my little numbers here. And um, we'll get started. So I'm going to actually, since I see Roger there, can you turn on your... Can I unmute you, Roger, there, and have you open us in prayer? Would that be all right? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Sure. You got me open? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Father in heaven, we give you praise and honor for this glorious day that you've created, and we thank you, Father, for being a sovereign and wise and powerful God that you are. We uh, ask your blessings now as we study your word and learn more from the words, quite frankly, of your dear Son and our Savior. Uh, just ask your, your wisdom as Tom presents that and uh, our minds that we be sharp as we uh, consider all those things and apply them to our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, again, lesson 13. That's what we're on. Um, and you can get it from the file section of Hope Book. Mm -hmm. You know that by now. I'm just repeating myself. And um, I'm going to read the text. It's uh, Matthew 6, 7 through 15. So we're starting to get into the heart of chapter 6, which is good, in the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll go ahead and read that. And I'll go ahead and mute you back there again, everybody. All righty, Matthew 6, 7 through 15. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. We're going to talk about that. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And now we come to the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine or yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then this addendum, which is part of the instruction of our Lord about prayer. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So we're talking about prayer. We'll also get into forgiveness at the end of this. So just looking at the notes now and um, following along best you can there on page one, the introduction. Many, when we talk about prayer, many people assume that because people of all religions and all walks of life pray, and that's basically true, that their prayers work. I mean, a lot of people don't even challenge that concept. Um, is, is someone actually hearing my prayers? Do they work? They just assume it. It's a common myth passed around down here among men that God's okay with whatever kind of prayer that we have. The King of Heaven welcomes any kind of prayer that is given for any reason. As long as you're sincere, then that must be the standard that God uses. I don't know 
how people came up with that thought, but that is what people think. Think about a king on earth though, and I would ask this. Imagine uh, him swinging his palace doors open to anybody that just wanted to sincerely come into the temple palace and to talk to the king without waiting in line. Would, would a king on earth allow that kind of thing? Well, we think the king in heaven must, must allow to do that. Sometimes we don't even want anybody to speak to us. Well, probably not right now. We probably really want to connect with people, but there are times we don't want anyone to speak to us. And if they just assume they can come barging into a conversation or barging into our office or barging into our home and talk to us, we are always like, no, wait a minute now. This is not the right time. This is not the right way. But when it comes to God, people think, oh, it doesn't really matter how you pray. God will, God will answer. That's not true. Let's get that out of our mind. Letter B, prayer by definition is, and I've never found a better definition of prayer than this, talking to God. Just as when addressing anybody we meet in life, there's a right way to talk to God and there's a wrong approach to the king of heaven. Letter C, Jesus knew how to pray correctly. That's something we can count on. If there's anybody we're going to learn about prayer from, if there's anyone you really want to learn, what's the right way to pray from, it would be Jesus himself. He's the son of God. He knows his father. So he knew how to do that. His prayer life his personal communion with God were without parallel in the world. We can learn things from Moses's prayer. We can learn things from David's prayers, from the prayers of the Psalms, all of those things. But obviously no one knew God better than Jesus. Fortunately for us, Jesus not only set a good example in prayer, he personally instructed his disciples when they asked him, teach us to pray. That's why the Lord's prayer that we have here is so special. That's why it receives so much attention throughout church history, because it was at that moment. Lord, teach us to pray. Here you have the Son of God telling us how to talk to his Father, whom he knows better than anybody. Well, there are a lot of portions of Scripture that are relevant and powerful, but it's hard to do better than this one. The Bible has much to say about prayer. If you were to look for the bullseye on prayer, this passage would be it. For this is Christ's direct instruction about how to pray the right way. Notice how he commences in verse 9 with the words, Pray then in this way. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 1, there's similar instruction that was given to the disciples when they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Now I'm down to letter E for those of you following along there. By way of introduction, notice in verse 7, it's not the number of prayers that matters to God. That's because you, I have questions about prayer. You have questions about prayer. One of them might be, how often should I be praying? And right away, we see it's not the number, it's the quality. I think maybe all of you guys already knew that, but... Um, just think about that. Maybe you'll have a question about that later. Not the number, but the quality. Um, verse 9, Jesus instructs nothing here about style that we should use in prayer. Most people, I remember when I was getting started praying and I was going to the prayer meetings on the campus fellowship and I was a new believer, a lot of my questions about prayer had to do with the how-tos, the style of it, you know. Maybe you're beyond that. Maybe you have questions about that. I don't know. But notice here, he doesn't tell us how to stand or sit or kneel or walk walk around your house seven times. There are a lot of people have those thoughts about prayer, but he doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't tell us to use anointing oil. I remember when I was moving into a new home, someone said the previous tenant was into all kinds of occultic thing and I should take anointing oil and go all around the house and pray for it. But Jesus doesn't say anything about that here or burning incense or anything like that. He doesn't tell us what to wear. You know, you should wear a prayer shawl or a prayer hat. Maybe it makes you feel more holy, but Jesus didn't say anything about that. He doesn't tell us what we should be holding in our hands, you know, going over the rosary beads or holding a silver cross in our hands or anything like that. He doesn't even tell us what time of the day to pray or the length of the prayer or where to pray to the east or the west. You know, like the Muslims, you have to face a certain direction. Why? If God is all the way around the globe, if he's everywhere at one time, why would one direction be the important thing? Well, none of that is in Christ's instruction because none of that improves or enhances prayer. Instead, Jesus says, it's not the style you use in prayer, but the substance that matters to God. People who concerns, concern themselves with style are probably missing the whole point about prayer. Many pray, remember our last lesson? They do so to be honored by men. They wanna be seen as religious by men. They wanna be rewarded in this world for their religiosity. But style and show are for men. Substance is for God. That's our introduction. That's Roman numeral number one. 
Let's go in a little bit further before I open it up for uh, questions and comments. We're going to go to Roman numeral two. We're going to start with the wrong way to pray. Who is the wrong uh, example of praying? And the answer is the Gentiles. You know, uh, when you pray or praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Here's the wrong example. Okay. Here we have the answer to four questions about prayer. Each question will help us clarify what is wrong with many prayers today. By the way, what, if you haven't figured out, as we're going through this, this has direct application to your understanding of prayer, to what you're pursuing while you pray. We're at a time here in this uh, virus where we're quarantined. We have a lot of time to pray. So if you're looking for an application, I would say, hmm, it's just really good to focus on, well, what am I praying for and why? And what, what are the best prayers? So this is a great time to learn this lesson. All right, letter B. First question, what is the wrong way to pray? Verse 7 contains the answer. Do not use meaningless repetition. That phrase comes from one word in the original Koine Greek language. It is the verb bata lageo. It even sounds like, you know, chatter. Bata lageto, you know. It means idle chatter or thoughtless words. It even sounds that way. The idea is to convey constant, thoughtless, pouring out of endless words. Now, right now, you might have a misunderstanding, so I put in the notes, don't misunderstand. Christ is not forbidding repetition in prayer. I remember someone telling me, look, I asked God one time. He now knows. Why should I ever have to pray again? Well, there are repetition prayers in the Bible, and we actually are encouraged somewhat to repeat. So this is not telling us never repeat. In fact, Jesus himself repeated a prayer three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And Gethsemane said what? Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In fact, there are two whole parables in Luke 11 and Luke 18 that are dedicated to the idea of persistence in prayer. You don't have something, so you keep asking for it, keep asking for it, keep asking for it. Well, that means that you're going to be repeating your prayer. Number three, nor is Jesus insisting that our prayers be short. He himself had a habit of staying out all night in prayer or ra rising very early in the morning to pray. What's wrong is the, what the Gentiles did is it was repetition to show zeal, repetition for repetition's sake, repetition to show passion, that, like it was the emotion and the energy and the, oh, I'm going to keep pounding away. And it was me, really, that was producing the results and the answer to the prayer. That's what was wrong with it, you see. Second question. Who prays with meaningless battle? Well, we kind of already answered it. Verse 7 in the middle, the Gentiles do. Jesus, of course, was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, still up there on that platform. He's speaking to almost, probably almost 100% Jews. There might have been a couple of Gentiles scattered in there. The term Gentiles, ethnikos, refers to all the other nations of the world. We get our word ethnic from it. The other nations were not joined in covenant with God. God had no covenant, no law with them at all. So they did not stand in good relationship to God. Jesus is saying, don't model your prayer life after those who do not know God. The unbelieving Gentiles are a bad example. They're the wrong example. Third question, and we'll go just a little further here. Why do the Gentiles pray with meaningless repetition? Well, again, look at the end of verse 7, where they suppose they will be heard for their many words. They think prayer is credited by sheer repetition, by force. They think prayer is sort of like buying a lottery ticket. The more you buy, the better chances you have of winning. So you're going to be heard because you just keep saying it, and eventually, well, think about it. If you were a leader on earth, right, and there were people constantly yelling in your ear, you might just out of pure irritation, you might say, what? does this guy want? And you would, uh, you'd give him attention uh, just simply because he was a pest and he kept bugging you. So maybe some of that is their thinking as well. In some cases, this heavy volume of prayer is really an outward show. It's to gain credit within a religion and among the faithful of that religion. In other cases, people do it because it's how they were taught to pray. They really don't know any better. They just, they just model the prayers of others. Number three, this is D3. We're in lesson 13, anybody that just came in recently. This kind of prayer also is just the easiest to teach others to do. Here, this is a great prayer to pray. Just say these words over and over. Some of you that have come from a much more formal kind of religious training background, maybe you got this, where they would hand you a prayer of a saint, 
or these are the words that you say. And it's just kind of easy. It's like, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, then just say these words and you just say them again and again and again and again. And you think, well, I'm going to say them and I'm going to keep saying them and I'm going to say them so many times. God's going to see how dedicated I am to him. And, and he's, he's surely going to answer me because of this. You know, these are approved prayers. They've worked with other people. They'll work with you. Well, of course, nobody wants to say unapproved prayers. That's why some just repeat the ones they've been told will work. Prayer to them is akin to magic. You have to get the incantation right. You know, you, you didn't say it right. You didn't say open sesame. You got to say it with more, you got to say it more like this. And, and they might think it's kind of like that. Now, one example of meaningless repetition in prayer from the Old Testament were the Baal worshipers of Elijah's day in 1 Kings chapter 18. I don't know if you remember that story or not. But you may remember this is the place where they were, they had the contest on Mount Carmel, and it was who is the God over Israel? A king, evil King Ahab, who was married to Jezebel. They were allowing all the prophets of Baal from um, Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, to the north, and all of the false god of Baal. And Elijah was like, No, you need to return to the God that you're covenant with, with Yahweh, the God who gave you this land and gave you um, your law and he looks after you. And the people were hesitating between the two opinions. So they had the big contest on Mount Carmel. Who is the right God? Well, Elijah let the uh, prayer warriors of the Baal religion go first. And they ranted and they raved all day long. They cut themselves. They were bleeding. And they were basically saying the same thing over and over again. Oh, Baal, hear us, answer with fire, you know, and all the rest of that. And, um, the bottom line is after all those hours of praying, it didn't work. Um, it was to no avail. In contrast was Elijah's simple prayer, yet very insightful. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to see. A, a short prayer said with the right heart and the right way with the right meaning is going to accomplish a lot more. That's exactly what he did. He just got down on his knees and he said, Lord, you know that I am your servant. You've called me. Show the people that I've that the skies have been shut up with rain for three and a half years by your word, that I'm your servant, and answer with fire. And immediately, in a very dramatic way, one of the most dramatic answers to prayer really in all of the Bible, God answered with the most hot, blazing hot fire that it not only licked up the sacrifices and the water, but burned away the stone and everything. And the people immediately got the effect that, that Yahweh was God in Israel, not Baal. And they slaughtered the prophets of Baal. Today, some Buddhists have at their temples cards that are fashioned onto a rotary wheel with a handle attached. I don't know if you've seen these before. On each card, a prayer is written. As they enter into the temples, you can grab the wheel and spin the wheel. So what the idea is, if there's you know, dozens or hundreds of, of prayers on these cards, as you're spinning them, all the prayers are being said or they're being activated that the power is being unleashed, you see. And um, the more they spin, supposedly the more they're praying. Boy, that's, that's not prayer at all. You see, why, you see why the idea that as long as you're sincere, your prayers will be heard, that's just not, just not correct. You have to know who you're talking to. I wrote down here, I found an advertisement for a Buddhist prayer wheel that you can hold in your hand and spin it around when you repeat some mantra. Inside the wheel is a scroll inscribed with 50 mantras. And he claims if you spin the wheel fast, you can get a thousand blessings per minute. <laughs> Imagine that, a thousand blessings per minute. That's crazy. Uh, but that's what people think. There are also things called prayer flags. Now, I don't want you to get interested in this and go on Google and find all kinds of crazy ideas out there or anything like that. But uh, they do have prayer flags. You know, as the wind blows through the flag, it unleashes your prayer. There's no... There's no mind in that. There's no relationship to God in that. Uh, who knows, maybe one day someone will start a computer program with high activated speed prayers. You just click the mouse and it activates, you know, tens of thousands of prayers being said, and then you can be lazy and not have to pray any of your own. You can go to a Catholic cable station anytime and watch the nuns, the sisters praying over and over. What are they saying? I know they have the garb on. You think, oh, these are people dedicated to God. Look at the show. Look how religious that. 
is just exactly what Jesus is saying is not correct. They don't know God the Father. They don't know the God they're speaking to. And it's the same prayer. Pray the rosary over and over again. Just repeat it. The light candles adds effect, see, to be seen by men. Look at their spirituality. Look what we are. Bring the prayers constantly up to God the way they think. Not God's way to pray. Some Christians who claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit will babble, and they'll babble multitudes of prayers. They call it a prayer language. Some call it tongues. It's not tongues, because tongues would be speaking in a supernatural language. I mean, in a supernaturally speaking in a known human language, known in the world, but not known to the speaker. And that's proven from Acts 2 and the rest of the book of Acts, and that's what 1 Corinthians 14 and, and 13 and 12 are talking about, because they use the same terminology, same group of writers that are with one another, but they have this um, ecstatic language that's just a bunch of syllables repeated over and over again, and they call it a prayer language. I know some that have come to our church have, have felt that they've been blessed by having a prayer language. There, there's no prayer language, people. There's no prayer language. If there is a language of prayer, it's called faith, and it's called scripture. We pray scripture and faith back to God. We don't, we don't babble on and on as if God is pleased with babbling. If anyone knows the intelligence of God, what a brilliant person he knows that babbling would be insulting to him, not something that he would invite uh, in. I'm under number six under letter E. Then there are families at home who repeat the same prayers at night. You know, they sit down at their, their dinner table or they do it at breakfast or they have an evening devotion and it's okay to teach the kids some words to pray. I'm not against that. Um, you're trying to put some words in their mouth to get them to begin to pray. That's okay, dear Jesus. You know, you fold their hands and you say, dear Jesus, thank you for our food or something like that. That's fine. But over years when it's the same thing again, you know, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. What is that? It's Where's the, the growth and understanding among the children and the family about the God that's there? You see, Sometimes our society idolizes certain religious families that have these practices in their home, but that is not maturity. That is not how your home should be. No thought is given to what we're really saying. Christ is teaching that any meaningless repetition devalues prayer. Notice at the very beginning of verse 8, it says, so do not be like them. That's pretty emphatic. All right, now the fourth question, and then we'll pause. We're on our letter F. Why should we not pray this way? I love this. Look at verse 8. We're in Matthew 6, if you came in late. Matthew 6, verse 8. In the middle of the verse, it explains, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right away, and you're thinking, well, if he knows what I need before I ask him, why do I have to ask him? But you have to ask him, because um, he told us we have to ask. We'll get into that. You have to ask. But what we need to know is that he knows what we need even before we ask him. There's no reason to multiply words. God's already there. God is already listening. God already knows. He knows not just what you're going to ask, not just what might be good for you, but he knows the very best way to answer the request that you're asking. In fact, I would take it a step further than what Jesus says here and bring in the work of the Holy Spirit that Paul writes about in Romans 8, that when we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Holy Spirit speaks to God in a way that helps our prayers to get answered in an even wiser way than we know. That, that, by the way, is why it's important to ask God for something, but don't tell him all the ways to get it done. Just ask him and leave it up to him. He knows how to design the whole thing and get it done. Now, he may not give you everything you want, especially right away, because he wants to test our faith. He wants to test our motives and all of that. But he knows your needs. And all of your needs, your true needs, he's going to meet them. So all of this repeating of words is really an insult to God. It, is God asleep? Does God have to be awakened by noisy chatter? Is he some mindless force that's set in the motion by harmonious chance? Is that really the God and Father we know? Is he an uncaring deity who refuses to act until he's appeased with a hundred Hail Marys? Absolutely not. He's a loving Father who's fully aware of our circumstances, our weaknesses, and all of our needs before we ask. All right, I am going to now give you the opportunity to raise a hand and to ask a question or to make a comment. 
I have everybody muted. Um, and I'm going to start right there with Sean. And you are unmuted. Go ahead, Sean. Good morning, Pastor Leek. Good morning. All right. So um, I recall, um, I'm so glad you brought up the prayer language. I remember speaking with a coworker and um, um, challenging, you know, that we, basically we're discussing about the whole prayer language um, thing. And I remember, you know, um, obviously having, after having listened to uh, some of your sermons about, you know, um, basically speaking on the, the gift of tongues and that it was a known language and we see that in scripture. And right. so I was trying to challenge that person like, yeah, I don't, I don't see anywhere in scripture about, you know, there being this, um, this prayer language and so I remember they were trying to um, use Romans 8, um, just to, actually the same text that you would reference, uh, Romans yes. 8, 26, uh, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And I remember he was trying to use that groanings and, and talking about, you know, that that that's what comes out, you know, yeah. um, it's so intense that you can't even, you can't even uh, put it in words. And that was the prayer language. So can you speak to that? Yeah. And, and yeah. A lot of, that? a lot of people in the charismatic movement are trying to endorse their experiences and they go to the Bible and hunt for something that sounds like what their experience is. And rather than studying and knowing how to study the scripture and see what that text actually says, They'll just say, well, that's saying, that's doing what I, what my experience is. We're supposed to do the opposite. We're supposed to define our experiences by what the text of scripture says. That's why we spend so much time analyzing scripture. There it says that, that the Holy Spirit does not speak words. He speaks groanings and that we don't speak them. The Holy Spirit speaks them and that we don't say them to one another. The Spirit says it to the Father. So in all three categories, that verse fails to bring about what it is that they, they want. So just, I've done a whole sermon on that, but if you study that, you could see who's talking to who, what are they saying, what are they not saying. In fact, the term Paul uses there is that it's, these are sounds that are not utterable. <laughs> so to reduce that to just babble is really an insult to the Holy Spirit who's so much more intelligent. I imagine the inter-Trinitarian communication is much deeper than blah, 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 ma, 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 da, 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 da. So, I mean, it's really sad, some of the endorsements that come, but thank you for bringing that up. Great question. All right, other questions or comments? Remember, you gotta be patient with me. I'm scanning all of the pictures here to see if you've raised your hand either in the picture or if you push the little button that says you're raising your hand. And then that helps me also. Anybody at all scrolling through here? Okay, I got a hand there, Margo. I'm gonna unmute you. Well, you're already unmuted. Go ahead, Margo. I was just gonna mention to what Sean was saying as your and I'm sure he was, but as you're pointing out to people when they talk about their prayer language, just um, as you were saying, directing them back to scripture and letting them know, just help them to search it out for themselves, but maybe it not be confrontational because there is some fear. I was saved in a charismatic church, and so I was taught to be off this prayer language, and then later on, um, about a year later, there were some Christians who gently confronted me with the truth. And help me to, you know, said, well, search it, search it out and, and see. And I did. And I thought, okay, it's not true. But there is some fear there because if you think that you should be using a prayer language, then you think you could be offending the Holy Spirit if you don't use that language. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, There's a lot of intimidation in, in uh, religion. And um, if, if uh, again, what's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit it has nothing to do with that at all. And yet, uh, that's how strong leaders control their people to not study the Bible and not have their conscience in their mind developed to understand what prayer is from the Bible. Again, that's the beauty of the approach we're using here is to teach our people what the scriptures see so their own conscience can see that and not be intimidated by the forcefulness of one teacher, but see it in their, in their own eyes that that's not what it's talking about. Then their faith is shaped by the words of scripture rather than by, by the uh, the strength of a personality up front that's saying something. But you're right, there's a lot of intimidation in that. Good point. Now, I thought I saw a hand up there. Um, uh, is that Maria, a hand up? All right, let me get you unmuted. Give me a second. Um, unmute. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so two things. Um, as a Catholic until I was 47, 
um, when you light those candles, you actually have to pay for that. So, <laughs> prayers. I think I mentioned to you also that if the pastor mentions your name from the pulpit, you have to pray for that if you've been sick or whatever. Wow. Everything, everything is money. And, um, or, or you have to, by not only asking for prayer and paying for it, you have to buy a mass card, which are also leather bound. So yeah. that, so it's all about money. <clears throat> and, um, and we were also, when we had to go to confession, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you, your, your penance for prayer for sin was prayer. It was okay. how many times you'd have to say the rosary. Ah, Yes, it was 10 Hail Marys. But those were your punishments. So when I got wow. saved and started to understand you know, prayer, we were never taught to pray to ask for something or to thank God for something. It was just repetition. And that's all we knew. So for me to become a Christian, it was like a whole new world. Wow. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even about getting God's ear. It was just about fulfilling the religious obligation. You're being punished. How, what a terrible system. I mean, I, I have to say it. What a terrible system. I mean, well, how far no, away from God is that? No teaching about communicating with God. Yeah. That was, you know, the Our Father, but you were, it was never a relationship. Never had a relationship until I got saved and understood that's a relationship. Like, because when I, when I said, yes, I accept the Lord, what do I have to do? Well, it's already yeah. been done. What do I have to do? How many yeah. versions? Well, so thank you for sharing that. That really gives some insight. All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. And I see uh, Linda. I'm going to get Linda unmuted. You have your hand up, Linda? Go ahead. I do. Thank you, Pastor. I was just curious um, to follow up with what Sean had said. I know there are a lot of scriptures that reference the speaking in tongues. And I know that I have had similar situations where people want to use scripture to support it. So I was wondering if you can kind of share a little bit uh, more about 1 Corinthians 14 that talks about prophecy and, and uh, tongues. And it actually talks about when a person speaks a tongue, um, uh, they are speaking to God, but then there's a need for interpretation. Um, so I know a lot of people use that too, to support that idea that this babble is some type of a tongue. So can you just kind of speak to that too? Yeah, but not too longly. Um, sure. I, the language, the terminology in 1 Corinthians 14 that Paul uses to write is the same terminology that Luke uses in Acts. And that's the first thing everyone needs to know. That when they're talking about glossolalia and Luke is a traveling companion with Paul and Luke is being taught by Paul and they're using the exact same terminology that means that they are describing the same event. So you don't have a one kind of gift of tongues in the book of Acts and then a different kind of tongues in 1 Corinthians. It just makes no interpretive sense. No one would do that. If we took another topic and they were using the same terminology in two different books and they were traveling companions, we'd all conclude they're talking about the same thing. So, so then they read through 1 Corinthians 14 and try to find something that sounds like it wouldn't be able to be interpreted by the idea of a known foreign language in the world. And that's why I can't comment long about it, Linda, because it would require walking through the passage and saying, all right, every single time you see the word tongues in there, take it out and put in language. And it still works because the language is a language the, the person speaking does not know and the hearers do not know. So is there a need for a supernatural interpretation in that setting? And the answer is, of course. What they're trying to say is that that language isn't really a language at all. It's ecstatic utterance. It has just uh, syllables that are mindless. And, and that's not a language. Everyone that's tape recorded or studied what's coming out of the mouth of charismatic believers, uh, they say this, this comes out of the mouth of Buddhists. This comes out of the mouth of Hindus. This comes out of the mouth of other people that are involved in emotional religious experiences. It's the same syllables. Um, there's no language, there's no pattern, there's nothing discernible there, there's nothing intelligent about it. And so just take the word, every time glossolalia is used there, or tongues is used, take it out, put the word language in, study it carefully, and you'll see it's talking about a supernatural language, not known by the speaker, not known by most of the listeners, or even all of the listeners, and the Holy Spirit has to move into that situation and give somebody a supernatural ability to interpret it so they can get to the point which 
1 Corinthians 14, the main point of 1 Corinthians 14 is all about, so they can hear it in their own language. Because remember what Paul was contrasting, prophecy and tongues, and he said prophecy is far better. Why? Because when you get something in a foreign language, you can't understand it. It doesn't edify you. It doesn't go to your mind. You can preach to me all you want in Chinese and Japanese and Swahili to me right now, and I'll go home from church today, and I will not be edified. <laughs> But if I get something in my language, it benefits me because it goes to my mind and my spirit. That's what Paul is writing about in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, there are some scholars that say that he was battling, uh, that Paul was battling a perversion of the gift of tongues that had snuck into the Corinthian church, and that was ecstatic utterance. I'm not one of those, I don't consider myself a scholar in that sense, but I'm not one of those that interprets it that way. But that's all I want to say about tongues. Uh, for now, because I want to get, I want to move on to just the whole idea of how do we properly pray. All right, any other hands raised here? I'm going to scroll through. I have Deborah's pad. Can I unmute that? And uh, is, is Deborah wanting to speak? Deborah's pad? I don't know who that is. No, it's me. Hi. What, Hi, what, Pastor. Hi, Pastor Tom. That was an accident as I was trying to figure out my iPad, how to raise the hand like okay. <laughs> I am right. so sorry. All right. I'll, I will lower your hand then. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Michelle has hand up. Michelle. Where's Michelle? I don't see Michelle. There she is. Sorry, Michelle. Unmuted. Yeah. Unmute the audio. All right. Go ahead. Nope. Nope. You're not unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yes. There you go. Right. Great. Okay, so this is kind of a different direction, but um, so Sam is seven, and he, you know, last year had allergen exposures that messed with his cognitive abilities and, like, really specifically language. Okay. And so he has this desire to pray, and he actually gets very, very frustrated when he wants to pray. And so okay. we come up with an outline for him that he uses every morning in his little prayer journal. And so, you know, it's praise God, thank God, confess sin, and then make a request. And he follows it, but it ends up, like, it's very mechanical, like, God, you are a powerful God. Thank you for trees, you know, breaking that toy was sin. And so, like, we've tried to encourage him to, like, step outside of, the mechanics of it, but then he just becomes exasperated. So like, have we approached it in the wrong way with him or just like, is it okay for him to be so mechanical still? Oh, I, I like, I like what you're doing. Um, I've, I'm trying to think if I was a dad in the same circumstances, how, what would my goal be in prayer? My goal would be exactly what you're trying to do, Michelle, right? You're trying to get him to understand God you're trying to get him to understand meaning to the words, that it's not just the words, it's meaning, that there's a person you're actually talking to. And I don't know enough about what a child like yours needs to know uh, in terms of the, the educational steps that you would need to get him to see that. But your heart and your goal is certainly right. I would applaud that because the point isn't to develop uh, a hypocritical kid that just shows up, says the prayer, he's done with it, checks it off, look, I'm religious and I'm good. Your goal is you're trying to do your very best in your heart for him as a parent to get him to talk to God and know God. And I, I don't know that I would have any more knowledge. I mean, someone would probably have to work with you and help you to figure that out. Sounds like you're on the right track, but in terms of what you're trying to do, I applaud that. I think that's exactly what I would be doing. Great. Thank I don't, you. You know, when, when Jesus is saying, don't do repetition, he's not talking about circumstances like this, where we're trying to we're trying to teach our kids and take them from where they are to where they need to be. That's just solid education. Great. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Good question too. I just don't think I can give a good answer to all of those. <laughs> all right. Any other thoughts or questions folks on the meaninglessness, how the Gentiles approach uh, prayer? Maybe you have a question about something you've been doing. You've been repeating a prayer and you're wondering about it. Um, Anything like that? Okay. Uh, there's a, Donna Sparza has a question on chat about prescription prayers using the Acts method in particular. Prescription prayers? Oh, you mean like with an acronym? Okay. 
Oh, ACTS, Don, I think I remember that it was adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, something like that. Is that what it is? Um, yeah, I think that's great. I mean, some people use the Lord's Prayer that way. What should I be praying for? I'm starting with praise. Uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, I'm done with praise. Now I'm going to go to my petitions, you know, or, or something like that. Um, I start with God and his program, then I go to my needs, and then I go to my confessions and things like that. I don't have any problem with a pattern for prayer. I don't think that that's what Jesus is against. I think the problem would be is if it just becomes mindless, and it becomes rote, and it becomes showy. And I think that those little inventions people have of things to try to remember in their brain, particularly when you're waking up in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm kind of tired, what do I pray for? If you have a little memorized a little memorized acronym that helps you move through prayer and goes along, I could see that being a really helpful tool. I've used one myself before. Oh, so we get questions through chat too. All right, that's cool to know. Can't find my chat thing though. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. All right, let's see. Oh, there's the chat. Okay. Uh, all right. Any anybody else? Anybody else? All right, we're gonna. This, do this yep. is Dawn. Okay, Dawn. I, I can't find the how to raise my hand button. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Just to follow on to the axe thing, I think one of the biggest struggles that I've always had with that is feeling like. It's probably a personality thing where I heard someone talk about the Acts method of praying. Okay. And from that point okay. on, I felt like God's not going to hear your confession unless you adore and praise him first. He's not ah. going to hear your requests unless you're fully confessed up first. Right. So how would you address being stuck and feeling like he's not going to hear you unless you're sinless? Quote I would say that person that told you that might have been sincere. They might have been trying to guide people to know how to pray. They might have really wanted you to confess sin and all of that. But when I read the Psalms and David, I mean, I don't know if that person read the Psalms, but they start every which place. Sure, a lot of them start with praise, um, but some of them start with, how long, oh God, until you hear my request? Because they're in a desperate situation. I mean, prayer is, what did we say prayer was? Prayer is talking to God. When I talk to God, I want to be as real as I possibly can be. I hope you all hear that. I want to be as real as I can. If my heart is not thankful and I'm, I'm bothered about something, I, I usually start with that. Lord, and I, I begin with my complaint. There's Psalms that start that way. And then they work into, I realize that the state of my soul was wrong when I was complaining to you, O oh Lord. Thank you that I could bring my complaint to you. Now I'm bringing my thanksgivings to you. I'm injecting faith into that as well. I don't think that the order, I don't think, you know, we're talking about repetition in prayer, not so much order. Your question, Don's more about order. I don't think the Lord Jesus cared as much about order. I think there's a little bit there to the order. I mean, when he gives his model prayer, he wants us to put God first, but he knows prayer is real and we're going to be in different circumstances. Samson, when he was about to, um, he was about to die because he didn't have anything to drink. He wasn't going to take time to write out a long psalm of praise to God. He just said, Lord, are you going to let me die of thirst in the wilderness after giving me this great deliverance? He, he cried out for water right away because that was his need. And that's what prayer should be. Um, if you're talking about regular prayers, I think the Lord would encourage us, get our minds focused on adoring God first. Does it have to be that way every time? Absolutely not. And your conscience should not be bound by that. So I don't know what happened back there, but I think your conscience can be freed from that. Wow, I never know what questions I'm going to get. These are really great questions. All right, any other questions on prayer? I want your prayer lives to grow during this time. We have, we've been given, as I've been saying, a golden opportunity to pray more, to memorize scripture more, to get our minds right. I'm going to be talking about that today in the sermon, and I hope it goes well. What time do we have here? We got, we got about quarter after. Let's get into the right way to prayer, and that way we'll have time to discuss that also, okay? Let's go to Roman numeral three, the right way to pray. Now, we're just beginning the Lord's Prayer here, or the Disciples' Prayer. We're going to be in it three weeks, so hopefully during this time, God will use it. Maybe this is providential, guys, that we're getting to go through this well-known prayer, but evaluate our prayer lives right at this time. Maybe God wants to do great things through our prayer lives. All right. This section is what has been labeled the Lord's Prayer. Truly, it is a magnificent prayer. Its eloquence and symmetry have made it a favorite to memorize and to sing. And though it's short, it's stuffed full of truth and insight 
about the right way to pray. It consists of three sets of three statements. If you get into these kinds of things, I like to find the, the literary uh, balance to some of these scripture writings. So this might even help you. Three sets of three statements. The first three are requests centered on God. Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The second, there are three requests that are centered on our needs. So they're sort of requests aimed at God and his glory. And then there are a second set of three that are on our requests. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But I take delivering us from evil as the second half of leading us not into temptation. And then it ends with, at least in some of the manuscript traditions, it ends with three bursts of confident praise. And I like the word thine. I don't know, maybe because from my early days, I always said thine. If you say yours, no big deal. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Kingdom, power, and glory. Wow. So there's a lot in there. Three bursts of three uh, statements or requests. In a few short lines, this prayer encompasses so much of what prayer should be. We all know when we read through the Bible that prayer should involve praise for God the Father. It should involve our uh, breaking down our will and learning to pursue the will of God. Yes, we should have confession of sin. God's a holy God, and we should say, forgive us our debts. In fact, many times we need to enumerate what those are. And so that's in there. And then there's earnest requests for needs, basic needs. You know, the Lord puts in, uh, give us this day our daily bread, you might think, well, why are we only asking for bread? But remember, bread is going to be representative of all of our physical needs. So here we could be saying things like watch over our safety in the midst of a pandemic. And that would be perfectly fine with the Lord. It also has confidence that God will provide. I mean, why be making these strong, staccato, direct petitions to God if we don't have confidence that he's going to do it? So it, it breathes confidence. The other thing I love about this prayer, and I didn't notice it until I was uh, going through and studying it years ago, just how much theological truth is packed into it. Um, when we pray better, it's because we know the Word of God better. We know theology better. Uh, a knowledge of God really helps us be better prayer warriors. And then there's a heart of thanksgiving throughout the whole prayer. That was letter C. Go on to letter D. It does indeed show us the right way to pray. We're not like the Gentiles here, are we? It shows the right way to address God, our Father who art in heaven. Um, and by the way, he was not saying that's the only way to address God, but it's a right and a good way. And we're going to talk about that. Um, the right way to make requests of God. How do I make requests? Where, how, do I, how do I position my requests so they're the kind of requests that God knows I'm asking them because I'm trying to fit into his, his will? And then the right praise offered to God. Um, God deserves praise, but are we giving him the right praise? What if someone came up to the Lord Jesus and said, uh, you know, you're a good rabbi. And they did, do, they did indeed do that when he was on earth. That's not as lofty a title as when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus was like, now that's the right kind of praise. That's the right identity that's coming to me. And uh, he praised Peter for having seen that. Well, we need to praise God for who he actually is. Number four, the right perspective to maintain in the presence of God. You know, sometimes we, um, we're too casual in prayer. We do need to approach God uh, as a friend. I don't want to say it, it needs to all be formal, but sometimes we treat, we lower God down, and we need to have a, a, a lofty view of God throughout. The right view of ourselves underneath God, the right view of our needs in relation to God. I was asked, I was talking to Susan about this. Why are we getting hit with all these trials? You know, why doesn't the Lord just give us good health, give us a lot of money for the church so we can give lots of money to our missionaries and lots of money for all of our programs and lots of money to help the other churches in the area and, and to get people hired so they can do all the things they want. And just everything would be easy. And, and the answer has to at least in part be that if we were given everything that we felt we needed, it would take away from us that sense of dependency we might 
become like that rich man that thinks, you know, I don't need anything else. I have all these barns that are full of all this food. I'll just uh, tear down my old barns and build, build bigger barns and I'll sit back and have ease of life. I don't really need God in my life. Indeed, the rich in this world often are in a very bad situation spiritually. They, uh, they don't realize their needs. So God keeps us with our needs there. If you're wondering right now, what about the job? Will I have a job when I go back? Why has God put me in this situation? Is, is God tempting me? No, God never tempts us, but he does test us. And he puts us in a position where we always have to be in need, where we we'll cry out to him. And then, of course, there's the right balance and the order and all the words. We're not just asking petitions. We're not just confessing sin. We're not just praising. There's a good balance to all of it. And so it's a great model for prayer. All right, that was letter D. Letter E. Furthermore, a spirit of humble dependence on God breathes throughout. We are low down here on earth, and we have to petition God up above in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, that high and lofty place with all the resources, we pray your kingdom comes down here to this needy place called earth. Uh, we need spiritual protection, you know, protect us from the evil one. He's out there. We don't know what he's up to. Guard us from the evil one. Guard us from evil. There's daily food that's need, even forgiveness. Lord, we know we're going to pray and we're going to get up from this prayer and then we're going to go do what? We're going to mess up again. We're going to have bad attitudes and we're going to sin again. And so it's expected. We're going to come back into your presence and you already know it and you're okay with it in a sense as long as we say, Forgive us our debts, those things in which we're indebted to you. Of course, God is a father who's willing to provide all. We, we have to subject our will to his. And then he enlists us to do the work of his kingdom. Because we're saying, your kingdom come. We're immediately saying, not only are we praying your kingdom will come, but we want to be kingdom workers. And after we pray, use us. Use our spiritual gifts. Help us to get out there and build the kingdom. Of course, we're bound by trials and temptations, but God eternally possesses all power and glory. He has all thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. So why would we go to any other source when God has it all? So if you just really survey the prayer and think about it in totality, it's, it's brilliant. It's succinct. It has everything that we need to know how to pray. Um, what a prayer. What a model for our prayers. Now, <laughs> look at letter G. Unfortunately, but predictably, many people have understood this prayer. In particular, there are two misconceptions that are common about this prayer. I want to go through this. The first misconception is that this is the Lord's prayer. If we mean by this title that the Lord taught it, then the title is fine. It fits. Yet we must remember that Jesus himself never prayed this prayer. It was a prayer, in fact, he could not pray. For the petition, forgive us our debts, would be out of place on the lips of the sinless Lamb of God. Many have failed to notice the opening of the prayer in Luke 11, 2, which says that Jesus taught his disciples to pray that prayer. This prayer would be better called, indeed, when Dr. MacArthur did his series of sermons on this, he called it the disciples' prayer. The addresses and the petitions in it are all plural. plural. Our Father, who art in heaven, forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Wow. It's a prayer to be prayed with other believers. Now, the second misconception is that this prayer was meant to be repeated. It's kind of ironic because he just finished saying, don't use meaningless repetitions. And what do some people in church do? They take the Lord's Prayer, they memorize it, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with memorizing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with saying it back to God, but they might do it mindlessly and just repeat it. We did that growing up in one of our, in my Protestant church, just repeat it again and again. I know I didn't think about it. No one told me to think about it. No one explained it to me. Nobody said this was a model prayer. They just had the moment in the time in the service where you said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it gives us day our daily bread and forgive. And we just, we just rattled right through it, right? Isn't that amazing? Jesus just finished saying, don't use meaningless repetition. And look what Satan carves up, and they do that. Um, many think that they've internalized this prayer simply by memorizing and saying it in unison in a worship service. Jesus just finished teaching his disciples not to pray and wrote. Look very carefully at verse 9 again. It does not say, pray this prayer. I think that's how some people read it. Pray this prayer, our Father who art in heaven. No, but pray in this way. 
Ah, so that's going back a little bit to Don's question. When someone gives a little acronym or something like that, they should be describing it as, here is a way in which you can pray. Here's a helpful way to guide your prayer. Not do this and no other way, you see. Don't pray this prayer, pray in this way. There's a big difference. The Greek adverb uses hutos, and it means in this manner. The prayer was meant to be a pattern to follow, not words to recite. You might want to underline that if you have your notes. It's a pattern to follow, not words to recite. The early Christians, we have no, no knowledge that the early Christians in the book of Acts, or even shortly after that, all memorized this prayer and set it together in a worship service. We just don't know. It's a great model. It's a great study of prayer, but don't just spit it back. Now, there's no lack of good prayer material here as a model. William. Prayer, its truths are so deep and so meaningful, it would take a lifetime to mine through it. To keep things manageable and concise, I've chosen to focus on five principles of right praying. And that's what we're going to start now. Five principles. We're only going to get through one or two today. Now, we're at the bottom. We're, we're at Roman numeral four now. I don't know how, I don't know if we're going to get through this lesson or not. Where are we? 1024. All right, let's just keep rolling. Notice how Jesus tells us to start our prayers. Our Father who art in heaven. Such familiar words. Yet their import may easily escape us. The mistake the unbelievers make is that they do not really know to whom they are speaking. Those that are caught up in false religion pour out many words, but God is not impressed with many words. And to add to that, think of Ecclesiastes 5 too. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of a God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. <laughs> wow. Speak your words carefully when you're in the presence of omnipotence, I think is the point. Number two, Jesus teaches that when we pray, we're not talking to some distant deity. You know, the deists thought that God just wound up the universe like a clock and he didn't care about it anymore and he doesn't care about us and he's not listening to us. That's not the true God. We are speaking to a God we know. In fact, we are addressing our own father. That should affect how we speak to him. For what is closer and more intimate than speaking with our father? God is a father who wants to know his children. That's why God has given us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. Romans 8, 15, we actually have the Spirit um, crying out of us and testifying that we belong to God, that he is our close and intimate Abba who cares for us. Number four, the Christian who learns to think like his father and learns to love the things that his father loves and hates the things his father hates will be the Christian who prays most effectively. If it seems that your prayers are weak and cold or ineffective, you need to first look at your relationship to God. How deep are you getting into knowing God and his word? Because the deeper you get in your spirit with the word of God and you know God, then the more you can take what you've learned and the lessons he's taught you in the word, and you can pray those back to God and it becomes more powerful. If you desire to enter into meaningful and powerful prayer, make sure you understand what God wants to accomplish in your life. Study his priorities. Yearn to let your life count for eternity and for God's glory. As Hosea the prophet wrote, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. You know, when we get saved, we say that we've come into a personal relationship with God. That's right. We now know God personally. But isn't there more of the Lord to learn? Sure there is. Letter B. When we pray, he's not my father, but our father collectively. Remember, this is the disciples' prayer. It indicates that we should be praying together as much as we can. We read in the early church in Acts 1, Acts 20, other places also, Acts 12, that the Christians devoted themselves to times of prayer together. I don't know if you come out to prayer meetings or not, but this would be a great application. Well, when we get through the virus thing, God willing, and we come back together and you hear that there's a small group and they're having a prayer, go join and pray with them. If you hear that we have the quarterly prayer meeting, come join us and pray with us. That's what Christians should be doing. When God's children come together to pray, then all the collective needs of the body are prayed for. And then God's children are striving together in unity on earth. Then each individual Christian is strengthened because I can hear your heart in prayer. You can hear my heart in prayer. We hear sister so-and-so pray. We pray together. And it, it, it's like coals that are put together. They burn hotter and they just help us all pray better. And I have a little note in here, by the way, if you ever are leading in prayer, I would just encourage you. I don't want to make a law out of this. I never say these things legalistically. These are just hints. If you're praying and you're with a group of people, don't say, I am praying, blah, blah, blah. Because what are the other people doing when they're sitting and bowing their head with you? Are they going to sleep? No, you're hoping that they're praying with you, right? 
you're leading them in a prayer. So it would be better to say, we pray. Father, we have as a petition that you would help us to be able to support this missionary better. Because I, I, it's kind of weird in a prayer meeting when you have, let's say, five people sitting and one person prays for one thing and the next oh. person prays for exactly the same thing. So, well, do we all have to verbalize it or could, could sister so-and-so lead us in prayer for that one? And then you go on to the other topic and we'll pray with you for that. And instead of everybody saying, I pray, I pray, I pray, we say, we pray. Maybe that's just a thing with me, but I think that's the purpose of praying together. Letter C. Even though he is our father and even though we are to know him well, he is not to be treated lightly. Some people don't honor their fathers, right? Um, notice in verse 9, God is our father in heaven. Now, I could preach a whole thing on this. We could park it right there and just think, what is heaven like? What would God be like right in heaven right now if we could see God on his throne and all of his power and glory like Isaiah did, like John did? What would we be seeing? What would we be impressed with? Well, I'll guarantee you this one thing. Think about this. If you could see God in heaven right now, I guarantee you it would change the way you pray to him. I guarantee it. Do you agree with that? I guarantee if we could see God in his glory right now, our Father who art in heaven, and then we could just see him, we would never pray again the same way. Every one of our prayers would be as high and dedicated, as holy as we could make it. Well, Jesus impresses on his disciples the fact that God is a Father who is in heaven. I gave you a bunch of references there to look up if you want to do a little mini-study on that. In Matthew eleven twenty-five, 25, Jesus said the Father is Lord of heaven. And, of course, Jesus said that God gives rewards in heaven. Now, why is this truth so stressed? Well, because in Matthew eleven twenty-three, 23, heaven is described as a place of exaltation. That's why it's often described as way up there, above, in charge. Matthew 14, 19, Jesus looked to heaven and then he blessed the loaves and then they were multiplied. The holy angels live up in heaven, according to Matthew 18, 10. There the angels behold the face of the Father, according to Matthew 22, 30. In Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said that he's going to come back on the clouds of heaven when he returns. To know our Father properly is to know that he dwells on high. I don't know. I get discouraged in prayer just like you guys do. Please understand. And my wife can let you know, I'm, I'm about as real and honest in my prayer life as I can be. When I pray, I expect God to do what his word says. And when I don't perceive it happening, I get bothered. And I get bothered. I say, God, tell me what I'm asking that's wrong. I'll change it. But I, I'm always the one that's wrong. I'm wrong in my timing. I'm wrong in the weakness of my faith. I'm wrong in my attitude. Something always has to get adjusted back. And then when I see God answer, I'm like so excited. I want to be excited about prayer. Prayer is a tool. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is, it, it's the thing we've been given. We're so weak down here on earth. And we're, trying to, we're trying to grow a church and get people saved, and we can't do any of those things because we have no power to do any of it. And when you realize all spiritual work is impossible to do, it drives you to more and more prayer. And our Father, our Father, do something, you see. And He's Lord of heaven above, and He bends His ear to us, and He really does work. So that's the first principle there about prayer. We have to really know who we are speaking to. If you don't know who you're speaking to, you ain't going to get it right. Now, I'm going to go a little further because of time, and then we'll hopefully get a time to talk. I'll go to the end here. Principle number two. Remember, I already confessed I can't, I can't mind the depths of this disciple's prayer in five principles, but I'm giving you five. Hopefully, it'll help you in your prayer life, and we're getting near the end here. Hallowed be thy name. What's the next principle? Pray with high reverence for God. Do you have a favorite song that you sing, by the way, when it comes on the Christian radio uh, or you have it on your playlist and it comes on, you have some of these. And what it does for you is it just grips your spirit and just kind of lifts you up out of yourself. And all of a sudden you feel like you're above the clouds and you're seeing God in his glory and Christ in his glory. And you're singing up there and you have heavenly realities in your mind. If you can get there, that's where I think these words go. Hallowed be thy name. This is a statement of honor and great reverence for the Father. Actually, this is the first request of this prayer, because the phrase, hallowed be thy name, means may your name be set apart as holy. It is a request for his name to be hallowed. I know we call it praise, and it is. I'm not saying it's not praise, but isn't it interesting that the praise is a request that God's name be set apart 
in the world as holy. The word hallow, of course, is an old English word. We don't use it much anymore. It's a translation of the passive form of the verb hagiadzo, which is a common verb in the New Testament. It's related to the word for holy, for sanctify, and for saint. It means not just to give reverence to God, but to make his name holy. That is to treat his name as set apart from everything that's common. Uh, there are normal and natural names. There are common everyday things. God's name is not that. God's name is set apart. God's name for us must not be common. This is number three. It's in a category all by itself. There's nothing above God's name. Nothing do we treat with greater respect than the name of God. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Nothing do we treat with greater respect than the name of God. By the way, if you hang out with people that are always using God's name in vain, think about communicating in some way, in a gracious way, uh, and maybe lead into a good evangelism opportunity, that when you use God's name that way, do you know how much that hurts me? Because I hallow God's name. When I leave this workplace after hearing you use Jesus's name and God's name in vain all day long, do you know that I go to prayer and I take that name and I hallow it? And you're not really treating me very kindly with that. Just find, I don't know, maybe that's not the right way to say it exactly. You find the right way to say it, but let people know that name is something that you really honor. Now, why do we say the name rather than God? Why not just hallowed be you, God? Why do we say hallowed be your name? Well, because the name, and you could do a Bible study on this, the name stands for all that the person is. In the Bible, when people are given names, it had meaning. So the name of God stands for everything that's behind. Remember, Moses was struggling with, well, when I get back to the children of Israel in Egypt and they say that God appeared to you in the wilderness, what name am I going to give them that you took? And remember what he said? He said, uh, tell them, I am who I am. <laughs> what a name. That's where Yahweh comes from, right? He is the God who is, the self-existent one, the eternal one, right? How do you give God a name that explains all who he is? We, we, we can't get there in our brain. But the name of God is who he is, God in all of his attributes. Number five, in scripture, the name of God is virtually indistinguishable from God himself. For example, Isaiah 29, 23, they will sanctify my name. Indeed, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I've glorified it. I will glorify it again. To glorify the name is to glorify the one who has the name. Of course, the world runs God's name through the gutter. That is a clear indication of the evil spirit that dominates. If you ever wonder, are my non-Christian friends around me, you know, good moral people, look how they use God's name. That will answer it for you. When we pray, we must regard God's name with the highest honor. I get a little bit tired. Please understand, I wish I had a chance to answer all your questions. I'm going to say this and I'm going to disturb some of you guys. So please take this with a little grain of salt. But I get a little disturbed when we keep saying our prayers over and over the same way. Our prayers are like, dear Lord, dear Jesus, dear Lord, dear Jesus. And every single one of our prayers starts out the same way. There's nothing wrong with saying dear Lord and dear Jesus. But when that's all that we say, and we're forgetting who we're talking to, this is not just dear Abby, we're writing a letter to God. There should be something extra there you know? part of the time, okay? Um, so try to think about the way you address God. Think about the spirit behind those words. Am I really reverencing him the way that I should? Well, we know God, that knowledge of God, rather than breeding contempt, should build holy fear and reverence into us. Number eight, I'm on. We're getting right near the end. Prayer in too many churches sounds more like someone talking to a friend on an equal level than a sovereign Lord high above. Many contemporary songs Supposedly offered in praise to God sound more like songs to a boyfriend than anthem to heaven's master. Go through your song list and ask you when they're singing, does this sound like they're singing to a high and holy and reverent God, or could these same words be sung to a boyfriend or a girlfriend? When our speech to God becomes overly sentimental, trite, and common, we reveal how out of touch we are speaking to the one above. Number nine, too often we speak to God the way we would speak to servants hired to improve the quality of our life. You need to get this done for me, God. God, how come you haven't had, please bring this in today. Amen. Get this done. Like we're pushing buttons. God, get my agenda done. So we yak in God's presence. I've done this. Boy, is that sinful. Yakking away in God's presence rather than thinking carefully what we're going to pray. 
would that we would but give pause to how irreverent our words sound. Imagine our words coming up with a really good bow sound system right into the courts of heaven. And all of a sudden, God sitting on the throne told all the cherubim, all the seraphim, and all of the angels, hush down a minute. Uh, there's Bill down there. There's John down there. There's Bob down there. There's Denny. And, and their prayers are about to rise up here. I want all of us to hear what they're praying. <laughs> Imagine that. And all of a sudden, everybody in this giant, holy, heavenly court got to hear your words rise. Would you be embarrassed the way your words sound rising up there? Think about that. Would you be embarrassed? Does this guy down on earth even know who he's talking to? Yeah, I think we're too casual sometimes. But now, I don't want to swing to the other side and say that I'm talking about some stoic uh, formalism in our prayer where our words have to be crafted to make us sound good before men. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying reverence in the heart for God. Well, prayer is an unbelievably great privilege a high and holy gift to be exercised with utmost esteem and value. Every Christian, every church has the duty and the amazing privilege to join the heavenly chorus, proclaiming to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Our prayers not only should praise God, but long that his name be honored throughout all the earth. Psalm 34, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So know the one to whom you speak, and pray with great reverence. You do those two things, you're off to a great, great start. The end. Prayer. And that's the end of the note. So um, now I want, what do we got here? We've got uh, five, six, seven minutes, we'll call it. And uh, questions, comments from any of you guys. Don, is that a hand? Okay. I'm going to, is that the old hand or is that a new hand? I want to, I'm going to undo you. Uh, unmute. Don, go ahead. It's not working when I unmute. It is working. Okay, it go ahead. Right. Um, yeah, I found how to raise my hand. So learn something new. Um, I just wanted to say I love what you put in um, the first principle under A4. You said, if it seems that your prayers are weak, cold, or ineffective, yeah. look no further than your weak relationship to God. Um, and I think in addition to... Um, being set up wrong in junior high by hearing someone preach about the acts method of praying in addition to that um while we were over in england having everything stripped away all ministry stripped away um okay. you know no friends no family you when you come to that place you're faced with who you really are wow and yeah there's there's nothing in the way um and you start to see how you view god and while wow. I was over there, I realized that for years and years, I had been imbalanced in my view of God, focusing more on him as the authoritarian on a distant throne somewhere to be ah. approached cautiously, rather than realizing how much a father of love and grace yeah. and how much he desires his children to be near him. And I think you're right on that your relationship with God and how you view him will directly impact how you pray to him. Yes. Oh, those are beautiful words, Don. And isn't it wonderful, you know, when you're going through confusing circumstances in life, like we're going through now, all of us, God has a good purpose with it. He is trying to draw us closer to him. We can't let the devil's doctrine get in our mind and make us think he's up to some sinister trick up there. Really good words. All right, I see Donna Thomas. Um, so I'm going to try to unmute that. You're, un you're unmuted. Go ahead, Donna. It's always kind of confused me, um, the line in the, in the prayer, lead us not into, into temptation, when in James it says God does not tempt anyone. Right. Um, so um, is that like a translation issue, or is I'm just confused as to why it's there? Yeah, we're going to cover that in uh, the next time. Um, so if, you, if I can get you to hang in there, I think that's part, blah, 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 part two. <laughs> and I'll go through that, how God tests us but doesn't tempt us. Why is that word parosmos being used there? And I'm going to reference James 1. If you want to go read James 1, you'll see exactly what you said, that he does not tempt us, but he does test us. And it really has to do with what the intent is behind it, even though it can be the same event. Um, so look into that a little bit. The other interpretive issue there is he's talking about evil in general or the evil one who's after us. And I'll try to cover that. If I don't then, then you can pounce on me with a question then. How about that? Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. And then I saw Ann. Let me get you unmuted, Ann. Go ahead, Ann. Think. Is that unmuted? 
It takes too long to unmute. Okay, unmute. Uh, yeah, I unmuted right, myself. I now. I okay, Pastor. Um, when you were mentioning in Matthew 14 that Jesus looked up to heaven before he blessed the loaves, it came into my mind that in John chapter 11, Jesus looked up to heaven before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, what do you make from that, Anne? What I make from that is that Jesus knew his power to do whatever he was going to do, whatever miracle came from his Father in heaven. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, a, there's just that sense that, you know, we know, we know it's a planet. We know it's a globe. We know that that's outer space out there. But we also know there's this other dimension of an original dimension that gave birth to the universe. And God dwells there and he has infinite resources and so it's a freeing thing I, I went out this morning in my prayer i'm going to reference this also in my sermon i went out this morning pray and i it was foggy but i still lifted my head up and i was like god you have all these resources and we're down here on earth and we're so weak and 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 i, I turned it into a more thankful kind of prayer where i'm like please bring your power and and work here to earth and it's such a humbling thing but it's such a hopeful thing that God will listen and he will answer. Thank you, Ann. That's good. All right. Uh, anyone else with a hand? Who is it? I don't know who that is, but um, I'm going to unmute you. A-L-L-T-H. Who's that? It's Willie. Hey, Willie. What's up? Uh, I, I, um, I have a question. In, in the Old Testament, uh, Joshua, after the defeat to in AI, um, after, you know, he went to pray and basically God said, Stop praying, get off your knees, they're sin in the camp. Is there any instances where we should not pray? Wow. <laughs> and you had to ask that at the end of the class. <laughs> that is great. That's a great question. Um, well, um, clearly there, I mean, that's what he just said. You're asking for my blessing while you violated the covenant. Remember that Israel in battle, Willie, was in covenant with God. God promised that he'd go into the land and fight for them, as long as they obeyed his covenant. Well, they disobeyed the covenant. I think that's because of the ban that was with Jericho, the, that guy took the, uh, the gold right. and hit it and all that stuff. So when there's sin in the camp, um, God was trying to teach Joshua and all of his armies, you guys are a unit here. And if you gotta clean out the, the whole Israel camp, if you want my power in your midst, I won't work until you clean it out first. So if there is a lesson to learn about individual prayer for that, it's sometimes we're going before God and we're saying, God, bless me and give me something. But what we know that's in us is that we're sinning. You know, it might be some, some guy that's like, he's been treating his wife terribly. And then he's running into God's presence and saying, Lord, my business is doing bad. I need money. It's like, well, quit asking me for provisions and go back and treat your wife kindly first. That's not really saying don't pray. That's saying, let's get things in the right order. I'm a holy God. Clean up, make your confession. And when I realize that you're real with me, I'll get real with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have. And if I missed your question, I'm sorry. I guess you could still shoot it to me, uh, you know, through email or whatever. We'll pick up with part two and um, everything next time. I don't know if Danny's still on there or not. I, I was trying to look for, uh, yeah, he's there. Danny, can you unmute yourself there and close us in prayer, brother? All right, thank you. Oh God, we come before you after this lesson about prayer to pray to you as a body of believers. We come before you, Lord, recognizing how holy you are, that we need to confess sin and praise your name in the highest manner, to recognize that we come before the greatest God there is. You know us, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our struggles, and you bend your ear to us, Lord. We do not deserve it. Oh God, make our prayers better. Grow us and sanctify us by your spirits so that we would pray to you in such a way that would please and honor your name and bring holy reverence to you. For you are worthy, Lord, and we are not. 
Lord, I ask so humbly that you would please humble us in the preaching of your word and the teaching of your word, that we would be conformed to it, submitted underneath it, that we would obey it, O God, for this is what you have commanded us. For your commands are good. They are not a burden. They are good for our lives and for our souls. Lord, bring us to our knees. Let us confess sin. Let us bring our petitions as a body of believers to you, knowing that you will handle it according to your good will and pleasure, according to your power and to your glory, for the exaltation of your son's name, that your name would go out through all the world, that people will bow the knee to you, Lord, for you are the king of this universe, of this world, and you are our Lord, for we have been ransomed by our champion, Christ. O oh God, give power to your preaching this morning, that your word would go out and that we would grow by it and be encouraged by it and be challenged by it, for we desperately need it. Lord, in all of this, we give you praise and honor and glory, for yours is the kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Quick announcement before you click off. Uh, Sean's trying to get a prayer meeting online for us. Uh, he's working on that right now, so be alert to some of those opportunities coming. Great application from our class. Love you guys. I can't believe how well you're, you're hanging in there with this class. Thank you so much. Your comments are so helpful. Your questions are too. Lord, be with you. Watch over you. Keep you. I wish I could hug every last one of you. God be with you. Take care. Love you, Pastor. Bye, Pastor. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Right. Have a good, have a Bye. Good